Tonight we come before you in Jesus' name. Count it such a privilege and honor, Father, to be here in the house of the living God as we are true temples of the Holy Ghost. You live, love, and abide inside each and every one of us. We can thank you, Father, for the times and seasons that we're living in. Many would say, well, you don't know how bad it is, and my Lord, we just need to get out of here, but this is our time to let the light of the Lord Jesus Christ shine in a measure like we've never shown before. We thank you tonight, Father, that there's a stirring and there's a raising, yes, that many may be missing out on, but you said by the word of the Spirit, you're raising up a great, mighty, exceeding army. Again, through the word of the Spirit, we're here not to equip them in a greater measure, grow them in a greater measure, ever increasing, exceedingly growing faith tonight, Father. We thank you, Father, that as we yield to you, as I yield to you as the pastor of this local church tonight, that the words that I speak will not be man's plans, thoughts, or ideas, but it's going to be the uncompromised word of God. We know the Bible, every single word of God, has within it the ability to accomplish whatever is promised and when received by faith. It not only has the ability, but it will change and alter the course of these lives forever, for we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. I know, Father, as I stand here by the Holy Ghost, that there's people in this place in bondage. There's people in this place, and I hadn't thought about this, but it's about the Holy Ghost, dealing with addictions. There's people in this place dealing with strongholds. But we shall know the truth, and the truth shall set us free. It is not a time to try harder, to work harder in that sense. It is a time, as you have been impressing upon me repeatedly, and I'm doing so again tonight, it's not a time for self-effort. It's not a time for the ways, means, and cures, so to speak, or efforts of the world to help us better self-improvement. We're not looking for self-improvement, self-denial, and trust in God. If any man's going to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. What does he gain? If he gains the whole world, loses his soul. He's gained nothing, lost everything. Thank you tonight, Father, no matter the state or condition of their life, which you know better not do. As I yield to you, Father, it's not just going to be a word tonight. We're not after a cute message. It's going to be the word. Ministered, directed, and anointed by the Holy Ghost. Minister to them tonight at their point of need. Because it's not your will. They stay in those states. They stay in those places. And I say, they're coming up out and over in Jesus' name. Yes. We thank you, Father. Jesus is the healer. He is the cure. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We thank you, Father. I know many may know him in a measure. They do if they're Christians. But the reality and truth of the matter is, as Paul said, we don't stop once we get introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ. Our determined purpose in this life is but to know you. And we thank you, Father, tonight that we're coming to a greater knowledge, greater understanding, greater experience, greater walk with you. And we thank you, Father. As they receive this word, of course, we said their lives are going to be changed. But we thank you also for the Holy Ghost that's with us tonight. He's our guide. He's our teacher. He's our helper. He's a paraclete that goes along beside us to help us to accomplish the real plan and purposes of God. We thank you tonight as the word and the spirit works together that you're going to move through us to accomplish your will. And we thank you, Father, as they've come expecting to receive by faith as I have. All our trust is in you, not in man. Not in a denomination or religion, but in Jesus Christ himself and you God the Father as the Holy Ghost reveals we thank you these lives will be changed challenging all forever never to be the same again most importantly Father the last amen your mighty name is going to be glorified magnified edified and honored and all that's said and done we thank you for it now in Jesus name amen amen you can be seated the children can be dismissed thank God for the word thank God for the Holy Ghost thank God for all he's done and all he's doing is as you have your faith and trust in him, no matter what it looks like right now, God is moving. God is working. Amen. He hastens and watches over his word to perform it. You say, well, facing an impossible situation only if you don't trust God. Amen. Not that all you guys are here. I understand that. Just say this to encourage you because it's one of those things that may not, you know, be for you because you're here, but it'll just solidify your faith. The Holy Ghost just told me I stand on the front row concerning this message I'm about to minister. I'm still going to preach it because it's for more than one person. But the Holy Ghost said, remind my people to always show up to their appointment. Remind my people to always show up to their appointment. Don't be moved by what everybody else does. Amen. You make an appointment with a doctor. 
and you know the doctor has help, aid, or cure, whatever it is that you need, you make an appointment with the doctor, and then you get that appointment. You don't show up. Whose fault is it if you don't get help? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Whose fault is it if you don't get help? Well, it'll be your fault. If it was me, it'd be my fault. He said, you remind my people not to be moved by the world, many in the church. Don't forget to show up for your appointment. There's somebody, and he didn't tell me who it is, but by the Holy Ghost, I stand on the front row. He said, there's some, somebody that's already in a bad way. He said, this message would have been for them tonight, would have helped them, and they chose not to come. Many would say, well, they had to work. And say, I don't get over to these things unless the Holy Ghost tells me, because I don't know what people's got going on. Many would say, they got to work, and they got these obligations, people's busy. The Holy Ghost said, it's called an unexcused absence. Yeah. He said, it's an unexcused absence. He said, I don't care what people say, I'll not excuse it. Because I appointed them to be here, and they're already in trouble, and it's going to be worse because they didn't show up. we got to make sure we endeavor to do our part. We endeavor to obey the Word of God. If you're willing and obedient, you'll lead the good of the land. God's got a good, great, and mighty plan for you. Amen. And we speak faith and speak all those positive scriptures, but faith is also an act. Amen. Faith is an action word. We don't just have faith. We walk by faith, right? I want you to go over to John chapter 20. If you look out in the world, in the natural, and, and many even in the church, and I say these things as a basis for the message God's given me, I don't say these things as a tap, regardless of what anybody says. It's not my goal. I have no benefit, no gain. Uh, if you have to, you know, put out another person's fire, as Dr. Hagen used to say, if you have to blow another person's candle out or light to make your shine brighter, you're in trouble to begin with. Yeah. So I have no gain in doing that whatsoever, but it is a statement of fact that there's more fear right now uh, seemingly in the world that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Some of you have lived longer than me, but there's more fear than I've ever seen before, even in the church. Fear and despair and, and many things, and, and many even now, I thank God that we've endeavored to trust God, are endeavoring to try to find out how I can safely get back in my church and hire all kinds of different companies and stuff. That's one of the biggest markets right now that's coming in to get everything clean. I thank God tonight for the blood of Jesus. Amen. I thank God for our faith and trust in Him. It's not boasting. I, bo I boast like Paul said. I make sure I do this. Paul said, I don't boast in myself, but I boast in the Lord. Amen. I don't boast in myself, but I boast in who I am in Him. Amen? It is a time greater than ever before that we need to understand that we must trust God. My title is going to be this. You're going to go to John chapter 20 to begin with in verse 19. It's just going to kind of be an introduction tonight. This isn't a one-shot deal. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But there's a, a, the title of this is going to be Faith That Works. Faith That Works. Because if you have noticed, if you paid any attention, when everything is going fine, almost everybody you know that says they're a Christian has faith. Yeah. All of them. When everything's going fine, everything's good, God is great, God is good, let us thank Him for everything, right? And all that's good, fine, and dandy in His place. But then you notice a drastic change when reports come out that contradict good things, contradict, you know, what people would say is good, right, and all these kind of things, and, and, and that introduce fear and induce fear, and, and many in the church would say, well, this is just wisdom, it's all natural. It's not of God. We want the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God is the applied word of God. We're going to act on God's word, but we want a faith that works in the storm, a faith that works when you face opposition, a faith when the devil unleashes everything he has against you to destroy you. We want a faith in God that works. Amen? Not a faith that when you face opposition, you go under. Not a faith that when the news reports come out, you get into fear and wonder what in the world you're going to do. No, we want a faith that works. And that's the title that the Holy Ghost gave me. And we want to see what that is. It's kind of introductory tonight. And one of the other main topics that is for you. I know it will help all of us, encourage all of us, and even those that were supposed to be here. Maybe they'll get the message somehow or another. I don't know. That will be up to their own free will. But there is a truth that I wanted to drive in. This is introductory tonight. With God, nothing is impossible. Amen. I want you to understand that. Because the Holy Ghost said there's people in this place that are facing things. There's people that will hear this message that are facing things. That even if you trust in God in different areas or there's, there's one particular area or maybe it's your whole life. I don't know. But there are situations and circumstances that seem impossible. If the Bible is true, it is. The Bible says, we'll get to that scripture in a little bit. It's actually Luke 137 and many others. But stay in John 20. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. With God, nothing. How much does nothing leave out? 
So you are not. I said you are not. If you stay in the word of God. And live your life and your belief system is God's word. Which is what it should be. We renew our mind with the word. And be not conformed to this world. No matter how many no's or no ways you get in this world. You're going under and not over. If God's word is true. With God. Nothing shall be impossible. Amen. So it is possible. Not in your own way. Let's, let's read this before I say anything else. But let's, let's look at John 20 verse 19. Jesus has died, rose again. Now he showed himself among many witnesses, but we're just going to pick it up in verse 19. He just showed himself to Mary Magdalene, verse 19 of John 20. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews. That's another message. But in the New Testament here, and then right here after Jesus rose from the dead, when they were dealt with opposition, they actually assembled together. That's a different message, and it doesn't apply singularly to the church today, but it does apply because it's the Word of God. Came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. When he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. You remember he was dead. They saw him crucified. He showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. 21. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, whosoever sins you remit, they remitted. And, and uh, they remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they retain. Verse 24. Anybody ever heard of Thomas? But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Verse 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord. But what did Thomas reply? He wasn't with them. Thomas said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hands into his side. What did he say? Unless I do not see it, unless I see it, excuse me, I will not believe. What kind of faith is that? That's Thomas' faith, the Thomas kind of faith, but we call that natural human faith. I believe it when I see it. You got to show it to me. You got to prove it. If I don't see it, matter of fact, if you get over into the education realm, you get over into reasoning, it has to make sense to people. That's why it's so hard for them to believe very often. It has to make sense to people when he said to trust in me with all your heart and lean not to your understanding, your own reasonings. Your own natural, not, not renewed, but natural mind, will, and uh, intellect and emotions, right? He said, and put my finger into the print of the thrust of his hand, thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Well, that's natural human faith, and natural human faith is based upon the senses. That's why it's always changing. That's why if it's natural human faith, it may be on cloud nine today when there's a good report and everything's good and then you'll think everything's good and the next time you see them, they're in the gutter. Because what changed? Did God's word change? Did God's promise change? No, what God has said has not changed, but their faith is not a faith that works because that's not to condemn, it is to correct because you want to walk out God's best for your life, but that's not a faith that works because the world and circumstances and situation, they're always changing. Right? That's natural human faith and it's based upon the senses. Going down a little further, 26, after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. 27, then saith he to Thomas, because Jesus had the spirit without measure, right? It already been revealed to him. He said, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. What Thomas said? He said, I, I won't believe it unless I see it. And behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not what? Be not faithless, but believing. Jesus himself called Thomas faithless. He said, you're faithless. Why did he call him faithless? He called him faithless because that's not the God kind of faith. That's natural human faith that says it's all going to work out. It's all going to be good when all of these things line up. We got it backwards, right? God says, take me at my word and step out when everything is contradictory. Everything may look like the evil report. You keep your faith in the good report and everything has no option but to line up. But we want it to line up very often before we step out and trust God. That's backwards. Amen. 
We've got to trust God where we're at because the word always works. It doesn't work once in a while. It works all the time, right? But we have to work it. And, and going by what we see is not working the word of God. Going down to verse 28, Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. 29. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Now what's the God kind of faith? Versus natural human faith. Thomas, because you've seen me, thou hast believed. And he said, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's the God kind of faith. The God kind of faith receives the promises of God and says, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It's so. It's so no matter what it looks like. It's so if I'm believing God for financial provision and then this happened in the world, the economy, and everything drops out, God will sustain you. Yeah. God will put you over. I tell you, very boast, very much boasting in God. I don't look at it often, at not people's individual stuff, but I looked at the total numbers financially for the church today. The church is doing better now than it has since we've been here. And people think that's ludicrous. It's ludicrous because if you trust God, what's going on outside has nothing, not a little bit, to do inside. And people will say, well, you don't know what everybody else, even people in the church are going through, you're out of touch. I'm not the one out of touch. That's right. Very often people are going under because they're out of touch with the Word of God. Yeah. This Word is not just for this church. This Word is not just for me. This Word is not just for a select few. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Jesus came to save, heal, deliver, and set free all of us. Yeah. Everybody you know in bondage, we need to get rid of. This is part of what the Holy Ghost is showing me. we got to get rid of all the excuses that we have made and all the crutches where we have not been trusting God because those things have been hindered. Since we're going to look at it in a minute, but Paul talked about this in Philippians chapter 3. Everything I consider gain or advantage for me, I now consider loss because I can't fully trust God and trust any and everything, even self at the same time. It won't work. I either got to trust God or trust everything else. And in this shifting, shaking world, as you can see, where Satan is the God of, and this is what people are looking for. It's what God's looking for, the God kind of faith, but it's what people are looking for. They're not looking for somebody that's just like them. They're looking for somebody that truly has the answer, that is working the Word of God. God doesn't just want you blessed so you can have the biggest house, biggest car, nicest boat, all that's foolishness. He doesn't mind you being blessed, but that's not the gain of them blessing you financially. But he wants you blessed. Rich means way more than just financial blessing to begin with. It's abundant supply of not just finances. It's abundant supply of grace, mercy, peace, glory, anointing. All of those things. The joy unspeakable and full of glory. God wants us to walk in those things even in these times. And when you're not touched by what's going on, it's not that I don't care about other people. But you are a walking advertisement and billboard. And you can't tell me that the word of God don't work because it's working. Amen. Amen. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but very often in the church and even preachers, and I love them dearly. I don't say this to condemn anybody, but I've been asked by preachers, what are we going to do? That blows my mind. I can't fathom a Christian that has any measure of faith, any measure of understanding of the Word of God. I want you to understand what we're going to do. We're going to take God in His Word. We're going to trust Him when it's easy. We're going to trust Him when it's hard. We're going to trust Him when it seems like everybody's going over. We're going to trust Him when it seems like everybody's going under. We're going to trust Him when we're living the good life. And we're going to trust Him when Satan's attacking our body. And it looks like we're about to die. By His stripes, we're healed. It works. God said it. We believe it. And it settles it. It is so. Amen. And there's nothing you and I can do today to make it not so in our lives, maybe. But this Word works. Amen. It's so whether we believe it or not. But if we want the fruit of it in our life, we're going to have to make the decision not to be like Thomas, but go to Romans chapter 4. We want to be like Abraham. Yeah. Romans chapter 4. Now, I wasn't going to do any of this tonight, but the Lord, as I began to pray in my office, when, once I got here, I already had my message or so I thought, but the Lord took me back to this. And it's, it's, it'll take a little extra time, and, but it's, it's not relevant. Only thing's relevant what God says. Amen. Yeah. We're going to go to Romans chapter 4 and we'll back up to, uh, just back on up to verse 13 tonight. But we saw from Thomas, faith that is based on the senses will not bring biblical results. The God kind of faith is based on God himself and his word. Because you can't separate a man from his word and you can't separate God from his word. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> it's like Dr. Hagen used to say, he said if a man's word is no good, then he's no good. 
If you take a man at his word, that man's a good man. You can trust him, right? You believe you can trust God? Yes. You believe God will do what he said he would do? Yes. yes. I tell you, I just believe more than ever before. We need to teach faith in God. The Holy Ghost told me so, so we're going to do it anyways. But we need to have a faith that works. A faith that's, that works is based in God, on God himself, based on the promises, on his words, right? Look at uh, Abraham, Romans 4, 13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void. And the promise made of none effect. Because of the because the law worketh wrath, but where for where no law is, there is no transgression. 16. Therefore it is a faith that it meet by, might be by grace. We receive what God has done by grace through faith, right? To the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham. Who is the father of us all. As it is written. I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed. Even God. Who quickeneth the dead. And does what? Call it those things that be not as though they were. We're talking about the Abraham kind of faith. But this is the God kind of faith. He calleth those things that be not as though they were. In the darkest hour he speaking the promises of God. What God has said is what Abraham is speaking. It's what he believes. What God has said is what you and I are saying. It's what we believe. It's like with the church. And your life is just as important. You're a part of the church. But we have not changed our confession. It's thriving, flourishing, and growing on every front. And you have people say, well, what about this and what about that? I've had people come and feel sorry for me. Or try to. And I feel plumb guilty. <laughs> I just about feel guilty. Man, what are we going to do? Y'all going to make it? I'm thinking, are we going to make it? Or are we going to make it? We don't just preach a message. And I do it humbly. I don't do it the wrong way. But I've had even preachers to tell me, man, man, this is impossible. Use those exact words. And I love them dearly. Those exact words. Impossible. If your preacher thinks it's impossible, <laughs> go for a bike ride during church time. I'm not kidding nobody. I'm just being honest with you. We've got to trust God. Yeah. And I've heard it for years. I've heard it in the individual life. And now more than ever in the church world, even among leaders. And it's shocking. Christians and even Christian leaders asking the questions, what are we going to do? Yeah. What are we going to do? And I mean, I'm just thinking, what's the Bible say we should do? That's right. The Bible says in Mark 11, 22, Jesus himself said, have faith in God. We may be facing all kinds of mountains, but they got to go in Jesus' name. They're not yes. no. Amen. God's going to show. He's going. It's, it's, it's not arrogance. It's faith that applies to everybody. Yes. But He's going to take us and show people. This is what He's He's dealt with me about repeatedly, even as late as this morning. He said, "What I tell you specifically, individually for yourself." He said, "I'm going to take you and show my people what I can do with somebody that simply listen to me, you and me, and obey me." He said, "In order to do that, you can never make it about yourself." There have been times I could have very easily defended myself, and the Lord said, don't say a word, I'll defend you. Okay. You know, if you defend yourself, you say, I'm going to let them know. I've got to make this thing right. Let God make it right. Okay. If he tells you to do something, that's fine. You obey. But very often, there have been times that I have sat with my mouth closed, and the evidence and knowledge that I had would have blew the whole situation up. And the Lord took me to Matthew chapter 5 that very morning. He said, if you say a word, I won't defend you. Right. He said, don't you say a word. You said, what happened? I didn't say a word. I trusted God. Everything turned around just like that. You know why? Because God's word works. Yes. Amen. But he said, I'm going to take you and show my people, not just here, but show my people, it's us together. Show my people what I can do with somebody simply is, you live, yield to me, listen to me, and obey me. Well, that's faith in God and not faith in self. And you'll see all kinds of ideas and all kinds of things going around and all these things that need to be done. You'd be quick to jump on the bandwagon if you're not careful because things sound real good. But the reality of it is all we have to do is trust God. He'll do the rest of it. He'll put us over. It's hard to do it any other way. I've done it other ways. It's hard. You go at it yourself trying to make the will and plan and purpose of God come to pass. That's where we get trouble a lot of times. All of us have been there. Many times people got serious with God, begin to pray and seek God, and know they heard from God. This is what trips them up. Know that they've heard from God. They know that what they're headed towards is God's plan because God revealed it to them. But instead of only, instead of not just they prayed and heard from God, you don't just need to pray and get direction from God. You need to follow His steps and accomplish that plan. Then what they'll try to do, and I've done it myself, they try to accomplish God's will in their own strength, effort, and ability. 
and you'll just flop around and mess up and do all sorts of stuff, trying to make stuff happen that nobody can make happen with God. Amen? You ever tried to make the will of God happen and been more, happen and been more tired than you were before you got started? It's just where you slap out. We don't want to be that way. We're going to be like Abraham, right? Calling those things that be not as though they were. Instead of saying what we're going to do, we're going to speak the word only. Yes. Who against hope believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations. Now, who against hope believed in hope. We know what faith is. And in, in Hebrews 11 verse 1, such things hoped for, that was things not seen, right? Faith gives substance things hoped for. But here, he said, who against hope believed in hope. Very often you'll have many Christians get in seemingly bad or hopeless situations and the next step is to tell everybody how bad things are. Don't fall in that trap. Amen. Don't fall in that trap. If you are a person that likes attention, you cannot walk by faith. Amen. You can't. You can't. Because you cannot give voice. Take no thought saying. You cannot give voice to the evil report and trust God at the same time. Amen. You cannot. It's impossible. Amen. We have to put faith in God. Many times with me, people have said, well, you just don't care. You don't feel sorry for so-and-so. It will not benefit so-and-so for me to feel sorry for. Them. They already got enough people doing that. It's of no benefit. You need somebody to give you the word and to set their faith with yours so you can come out of where you're at no matter what it is. The word works, right? He said, against hope, believed in hope, verse 18, that he might become the father of many nations according to what? According to that which was spoken. By who? God. But then of course Abram was his name. Changed his name to Abraham for what reason? Yeah, he did the name, the word Abraham means the father of many nations. Every time he said, I am Abraham, he's speaking the word, right? Speaking it into existence, calling those things that be not as though they were. Holding fast to the promise. So we, we must do According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Verse 19. And being not weak in faith. Now this is the opposite of Thomas. Thomas said, if I don't see it, see him put my fingers, my hand in the, in the nail stars and such, I won't believe it, right? But Abraham here, verse 19, being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. He considered not his own body now dead. He's only at 100 there. She's at 90. Sarah is. And he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. They're going to have a child, God said. That's part of the promise when he's 19. Excuse me, I'm verse 19. He's not 19. If he was 19, that would be fine. <laughs> in verse 19, they're going to have a child here. That's part of the promise. And in verse 20, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Right? And we know faith glorifies God. But he says here in verse 19, and it's unlike Thomas, was Abraham moved by what he saw here. Being not weak in faith, strong faith, considers not his own body now dead. But what did he consider? According to that which was spoken. He's going to hold fast to the very promise of God. He wasn't moved by what he saw. And what happened? It became. Amen? It became. Go to Matthew chapter 8. It became God's word works. A faith that works is a faith that's based upon God's word. Matthew chapter 8, go to verse 5. The law of faith says, when I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, I'm going to have in my life. Amen? What I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart, I'm going to confess with my life. And just like faith in God is, is in speaking, His word glorifies Him. If I'm not careful when I Speak the evil report if I do and murmur and gripe and complain and talk about how bad it is. Who am I glorifying then? Glorify the work of the enemy, right? Matthew 8 verse 5 says, this is the centurion. We see what Jesus said about his faith. When Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, calling for him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home, sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith, I'll come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But what did he tell him? That there needs to be marked in your Bible if it's not. He said, but speak the word only. He said, just speak the word. And my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And say to, his, say to this man, go and he goeth, and to another come and he cometh. And to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, what the centurion said, speak the word only. He marveled and said to them that followed 
Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. I have not so great faith. The God kind of faith is based upon what? What does the centurion say? The God kind of faith, the faith that works, is based upon God's promises. Right? It's based upon what God has said, what the Lord Jesus Christ has said. He said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. If he found great faith in anywhere, it should have been in Israel. Right? And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 13, Jesus said unto the centurion, that said, speak the word only. He said, go thy way. And how did the centurion receive? He said, as you have believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed the self same hour. How did he believe? He told Jesus, speak the word. You know the word of God in your mouth is just as powerful as the word of God in God's mouth because he's given us his word and it's his word either way. God said it, I believe it. That settles that God created the heavens and the earth by speaking the word. You create your world, present tense and future, by speaking the word. And if we're going to walk with a God kind of faith, it's going to have to be speak the word only. That means nothing else. That doesn't mean, well, I know that I'm healed but. I know I'm believing God for this situation, but the doctor said. That's not the God kind of faith. The God kind of faith in the face of death will continually say, by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Amen. I thank God that is so. And many would say, well, you don't know. You, you, I, you've been through this, that, and the other. I've been through this, that, and the other. You don't know that it works. I do know that it works. I know that it works more today than I ever have before in my life because we've been working it more. Matter of fact, you've heard me say my faith is at an all-time high because in the times we're living in, you come to a place that you better realize that you can't put faith in nothing else because I ain't going to see you through. You're not going to make it. And a lot of things that I have said by the Holy Ghost might have sounded negative, but it was true. It's still true regardless. Concerning the times and the seasons, it's the reason we didn't shut the church down. I don't really care what anybody says because I'm going to get to heaven and answer to God anyways. But he said, if you shut your church down now, you might as well get ready because you're going to have to keep shutting it down. And he said, it'll come to a place and not sustain itself. And he said, I'm not going to sustain it because I told you not to shut it down. So I'm not going to bless your own disobedience. He said, then you won't have a church no more. And people won't be ministered to anymore. Not here at least. And he said, you're going to see these things happen, but you can't control out here. He said, but you better make the decision now to trust me. Because if you don't trust me now with what's coming, you're not going to be able to stay in. So we just sucked it up and stood on the word of God and done what we've done, doing better than ever before. We thank God we've got the victory in Jesus' name. It is a faith confession, but it's actually a reality. Yes. It is absurd in the natural that we're coming out on the other side doing better than we've done since we've been. It don't make any sense what's going on. That's ignorant in the natural. Nobody, you say, well, they wouldn't believe it, but I don't care if they believe it or not. It's the truth. Amen. God can do more with less, but is it really less when your faith is in Him? Or are you, is there really, truthfully, we talk about majorities and minorities and all this kind of stuff. Listen, just you and God is the majority. Amen. If you got God on your side and your faith and trust is in Him, you're not going to think about to begin with. Amen. Amen? Even if you're in a mess tonight, you can put your faith in God. He'll bring you out. Yes. God is with us. Yes. Great faith, the God kind of faith, is based upon God's Word and His promises alone. Go to Galatians chapter 2. It's one of my favorite scriptures. It's actually one that changed my life just a few years ago. <clears throat> I just began... I actually wrote it on, uh, I do that on occasion. My truck has a place where you can take an index card that you can just, you can write on it and you can stick it right up in the dash there. I used to get on the children because I don't know what's wrong with them. I guess they didn't want to ride around with their friends in, in my truck and my scriptures up there. They take my scriptures and lay them down. I get in my truck and my scriptures would be laid down. I get mad. Don't lay the word down. You pick it up, you've got a good sense about you. But I have my scripture up there and it's Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. And I would just, every time I got in my truck, five times a day, one time a day, whatever, I'd confess this word and got a revelation on it, and it's very beneficial. Galatians 2, verse 20 was a scripture. I am. You say, well, I, I don't do that. We'll get you some sticky notes and put it on your mirrors, on your windows. Put it everywhere you need to. Amen? You need to keep your eyes on the word. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, that's not a natural statement, obviously, because you can't be crucified and live. So it's got to be, it's, it's got to mean more than just what you would think. It's surface uh, level value. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, right? But Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I'm still alive, but crucified. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith 
of or in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You can't do it your way and God's way. It won't work. You can't do it the world's way and God's way. Some of us have been there and done that. Matter of fact, I believe everybody has done, been there and done that when you first got saved. You tried and over and over again. Maybe try now. We just save you the time and effort. It won't work. It'll never work. Amen. You can't do it the world's way or your way, even your family's way very often, and get the blessings of God. You got to do it God's way. I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, how do I live? I live by faith in the Son of God. In the Son of God. I've got faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, what do the law state? Stated many things, 600 and something different laws, but still. You got the Ten Commandments and all the ones they added. But the law said, if I did thus and so, dot, 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 wash my hands this hour, this time, this day, all this kind of stuff, can only feed my donkey and all this kind of stuff, at certain times, then I'd be saved, right? And then the reality of it is, it don't matter how many of them there was, if you miss one of them, the Bible says in James. If you miss one of them, you're guilty of all. So you're defeated before you get started. Right. So our righteousness, our standing, our approach to God today is not come by the law, right? If it does, then Christ is dead in vain, which is without a cause or for nothing. But in verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. So I'm still alive, right? But I've completely come to the end of myself. The life which I now live, I live by faith in God, not my own abilities, not my own efforts. While we're talking about that, go to the Philippians. We mentioned this earlier. This is another helpful one, that if you want to get marked up, matter of fact, as the Lord told me that, He said, I want to take you and show my people what I can do with somebody. Simply yield to me and listen to me and obey me. The two passages that He took me to, to read almost daily, I'm not going to say daily because sometimes He leads me another way, almost daily is about Jesus and Philippians 2 and about Paul and Philippians 3. Paul only followed the pattern of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Jesus said in Philippians 2, he said, he made himself of no reputation, verse 7. Made himself of no reputation, emptied himself, took upon himself the form of a ser ser servant, and was made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself and became obedient even to death, even the death of the cross. There must first be a death before there's a resurrection. There's got to be a death to my own way. There's got to be a death. Amen? Just to be honest with you, you hear people make these comments sometimes. And they'll say, well, you know, so-and-so, they're not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Right? And I found this out personally. And then maybe you have said this about me. Most people haven't said that about me. But at the same time, I think sometimes you'd be better off if you was the dullest knife in the drawer. You realize you couldn't cut nothing by yourself. You couldn't get nothing done by yourself. Seems like the more intelligence that we have, the more know-how that we have, that the faster way I've raised. There's people in here I know by the Holy Ghost and on Sunday morning I know tonight. You've got to follow the same pattern. You always be following that. I was raised, and it's not wrong. My family's here. It's not wrong in balance. I was raised. It didn't matter the task at hand. It didn't matter what had to get done. Suck it up and do it. Suck it up and do it. Just get it done. Now there's a balance in that. If you're working, you've got tasks. You need to be faithful. You need to be diligent. You need to do those things. But if you get over into spiritual things, you get over the thing God's called you to do, you can cause yourself trouble trying to do it and go in it on your own. Trying to accomplish the will of God in your own strength. One good example, this just comes to me by the Holy Ghost, is about money. You have to be careful not to trust in riches. Why? Because the Bible says don't trust in uncertain riches. Why are they uncertain? They're not a certain foundation. They're not a sure foundation. God wants you blessed, but not at the expense of your relationship with Him. I was raised, you better work, you better work, you don't work, you don't eat. I, was ra I wasn't raised just to work 40 hours a week. I was raised that they offered you overtime and it was 50 hours a week. You'd lazy if you didn't take it. I've raised if they give you 60 hours, you're lazy if you didn't take it. I've raised if they give you 70 hours. You say, where's the cutoff from? I don't know. I was just raised, take it. Work. Do what's in front of you. And that's what I did the whole time I was at Blumenthal. There were very few weeks that I didn't work 65, 70 hours. That was regular. All the time. As much as 80 and 90. You say, you couldn't have done that but work and sleep. That's all I did. You can ask me for that. I had two days off the first year and a half we was married. I was going at it as hard as I could because I thought it was all right. I had a wrong belief system. I thought it was all right. This is what I need to do. It's the way Daddy raised us, intentionally or unintentionally. I know he meant nothing bad by it. But I got down, and I told you that. Just many years ago, many times in the past, I think, I got down to Monk's Corner, became an associate pastor. To make a long story short, I was going to minister a message called Success Happens 
success happens with was it success yeah preparation opportunity equals success or something that's the name all those three words are running but regardless part of my example was this i was going to tell them about my belief system i was going to tell them that you're never going to make it if you don't work like i work if you didn't do what i did and i will never forget it because see, when you stand up here and say things it affects more than if me and just miss lord he's out here talking it'll affect you and you might go tell other people it'll affect them and if i tell you the wrong thing it'll be conflict and the holy ghost told me this he said don't you ever stand up there and tell my people to do what you did he said because you were wrong no matter how right you thought it was he said if you'd have worked less and spent more time with me and your family you'd be closer to me and your family and you'd be further along in life than you are now he said you put your faith in the wrong foundation don't you ever say that's why you never hear me i don't get off on money i never have no matter what anybody says, I believe that we're to be blessed. But I've seen more people get off on money. Money's a false foundation. Yeah. It'll crush and crumble and you lose everything. Mm -hmm. Everything you go after to gain, I'll show you the line of the word. You say, where did it come from? Come by the Holy Ghost. Be careful. You say, well, we get messed up. God, God wants us blessed. You teach that. We tithe and we give. But that is trusting God. And then he orders your steps and you follow those steps. And God blesses you that way. Right? But we want to make sure it's God because that's where you can get skewed. There's all kinds of things you can do. I've seen people my whole life that get blessed in a measure, start tithing and giving, and then they forget God. They forget that God ever exists. And I've seen this since the day we got in ministry. They forget God. What happens every single time? That's not a sure foundation. Jesus Christ is the rock and the foundation that even the gates of hell cannot prevail against. There are things that I can do doing all sorts of effort. You can see it right now. A present day example. And again, I present these things to you humbly. I'm sitting back and watching, and people may get offended about it, but it's true. I'm watching churches have five, six stages of reopening plans, and they're having to come up with all kinds of stuff. I'm just doing the same thing we were doing two or three months ago. We don't need a reopening plan. Don't need phase one. Don't need phase six. Don't need none of them. Even people in my own church said you shouldn't have done that. That's what God said. So we just obeyed him. It worked out good. He ought to have better sense than the blessings like he has. He, not, he, he should have known what was going on, you know, behind the closed door and everywhere else. You say, what's that got to do with the flesh versus the spirit, faith versus the God kind of faith versus natural human faith? If you think about it, it's, it's much easier to trust God, to be honest with you. You can disobey God, follow the flow and do what everybody else is doing and make it ten times harder on yourself. I'm not knocking nobody, but everything that's happened to be done right now by most churches, I don't do that. They're doing the same thing we're doing the whole time. Studying, praying, seeking God, making changes, making adjustments. Now I know most of the church says, well, all that's right. Well, we just go with the Word and, and God Himself. And we stand on the Word of God. And like I said, God's He's the one out of His mind. Because He's blessed us tremendously. And I mean continually. Not just this past week. Pastor stand up here, we just got one good offering from start to finish. We've increased from the first day this stuff started. Yes. The church has increased every single week. Increase. Nothing but increase. That makes no sense. That is ignorant, naturally speaking. Yes. Right? But we put faith and trust in God. And you say, well, you're just boast, boasting in God. Yes. I'm just telling you God will do what he said he'll do. Yes. That's all I'm telling you. And to be honest with you, this is your church, just as much yours as mine. Yes. Amen. We sell the church, give a million dollars for it or $50 for it. It don't go to me. I don't own this church. I don't own this church anymore than you. I'm the pastor, you're not. But this is our church. Yes. Right? We're blessed. Yes. And we're blessed because we choose to be willing and obedient. But let's look at Paul along these lines. We don't want to be making it harder on ourselves. Sometimes the answer is not to try harder, but to trust God. Right? Paul said this. He said, finally, Philippians 3, verse 1, My brother, rejoice in the Lord to write the same things to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you to say, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. That last part says, and have no confidence in the flesh. We have no confidence means not, it means to not trust on, trust in, rely on, right? Or to make friends with in the Greek. Have no confidence in the flesh. I got this actually wrote in my Bible because it helps me to better understand it. It means to have no confidence in what we are, who we are, or our own efforts. Amen. You know, I always watch people, you have to be careful, and all of you know this. Some of you got some age on you more than me. But you have to, when you, you see people that work real hard, and, and they'll take the mentality, you know, I can outwork everybody around me. But just hang on, because I know you still work hard, but you're getting older. Mm -hmm. You won't be able to do when you get 70 what you could when you was 20. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying God won't sustain you, but it's, it's wisdom to use the wisdom of God. Realize you have to work smarter instead of harder. Sometimes. Use the wisdom of God, you make it hard on yourself. I know people even around here. I would say about them, my knowledge of them, and if I called their name, everybody around here would say, this is a man of God, he's a Christian, he's a good guy, but he's never worked smart before. Worked himself slapped to death. Now what I call working smart is not finding a way not to do the job, but it's trusting God and walking in his best. Amen? There's things, matter of fact, the call of God on your life, no matter what it is. You do not have within yourself, in yourself I said, you do not have within yourself your own abilities, your own talents, your own little, uh, what's, what you're good at stuff. You don't have within yourself the ability to accomplish the will of God. God's called you to things that are greater than you. Yes. Be honest with you. That's why people say it's so, it's so easy if you just, you just fall in the will of God and stuff. That's never happened to me. Yeah. It's never. There's people I have even recently we'll talk about, and maybe you don't think so, but I have people tell me, you know, you're a good public speaker. They have no idea what they're talking about. None. Zero. I turn down things, number one, because God told me to. But there's different things that I won't do speaking-wise in the community that I'm asked, because I've told, I've even told other ministers, because it'd be a natural thing they asked me to come speak at. And they've heard me preach at the National Day of Prayer and everything, and they said, no, we want you to come speak. I said, you have to understand, I'm a preacher. I'm not a speaker. That's under the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I said, I'm one of the worst public speakers, naturally speaking, that you'll ever find. If the anointing of the Holy Ghost is on me, I, I, I don't have the ability at all. So I've had to learn to not get in fear and to trust God. And I've learned that God will never leave you or forsake you. Yeah. But he always calls you to do things that you'll just be spinning your tires and wasting time if you try to do it in your own strength or figure out how you're going to do it because you can't. That's not how you get it done. You have to trust God. Sometimes it's turning things over to him and letting go of things is very often gain. So Paul said this. I have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also, verse 4, have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. What's he saying there? I know we don't talk that way. But he's saying, I don't care what any other man may, they may think they have a reason to, to have confidence in the flesh. He said, I've got more reason than them. And then he goes through, I obeyed the letter of the law, where I was born, all kind of stuff. Right? And he said in verse 7, what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. What things were gain for me, you know, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, right? Yeah, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I do count them but done. Everything that I had as an advantage, that I could say this is who I am, this is why I qualify, I went from counting those as qualifiers to absolute dumb. Why? Because you can't have both. That I may win Christ. You remember the cross. I'm crucified with Christ. Think about Jesus in the natural body form of the spiritual act. But the cross is a place of total surrender. I read behind A.W. Tozer about the crucified life. And he said one thing about the crucified man. He said he don't have any plans for tomorrow. He's dead. He's not making plans for tomorrow, next month, next year. He said, well, there's a balance in that. There is, but most people are on the wrong side, so we don't have to discuss it. He said, the crucified man has no plans for tomorrow. Because if he's crucified today, whatever's crucified is not alive anymore. Right? He said, I, in 1 Corinthians 9.27, bring my flesh into subjection. Right? I bring my flesh into subjection. I want you to go to... I want to look at one more because this is imperative. It's important. It's in two different places. But let me find it. Luke 18 is the one we'll look at. I'm going to let you go after this. But allow the Holy Ghost to help you examine yourself because I just sense in the Spirit that there's some people that's been in the places that I've been in. I've been in it with the church. The church and the people don't believe that. The church would drive me crazy if you let it. You don't deal with nothing but problems. Most people leave you alone. They're doing good. You don't hear nothing from them. You hear nothing from them for a month. And then whether it's the devil or they do something they shouldn't and cause themselves problems, that's when you get caught. That's when you get right in the middle of it, right? You know, people may say you're great and all this kind of stuff on Pastor Appreciation Day and all, or something else. But for the most part, all you deal with is, is, is things that 
are, are not positive, things that are not uplifting. And if you go by those things and then you try to work to get this done, that done, like a, I tell all the time, that's the bad thing about the church. If you want to call it a bad thing, doesn't matter how hard you work, people, many of them's already got a fixed mentality. All you do is you lay in your hammock every day. So no matter how hard you work at what you got going on, they're already lazy. So you just, you just, I don't even respond anymore. I don't say anything. So well, the food will be there. People think that I've been sleeping all day every day when I get by my pulpit and, and, and haven't been seeking God on their behalf. Then maybe I just need to trust God more myself. We'll just keep on going. Amen? Can't be moved by what others say or think. But don't you look at this guy here. And we'll close with this. Luke 18, 18. A certain ruler asked him, talking to Jesus, saying, Good Master, what shall I do to, to inherit eternal life? You can read this and think it's all about money, and you can prove that. I understand it, but that's not the main point. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, or except one that is God. Thou knowest. He said, What must I do to inherit eternal life? You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. He said, I've done all these things. All these things I've kept from my youth up. I have done. Right? I have done. Now, when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet like as thou one thing, remember concerning the law, if you missed one of them, you're guilty of how many? The Bible says you're guilty in all points, right? To be honest with you, you got your feet knocked out from under before you start. If you try to get good, you know, good and, and your goodness and your worthiness and your righteousness, why do most people not go to the Father every single day? Because they're looking at themselves. And I don't care who you are. Unless you lift it up in pride, that's a bad thing to look at. Because yeah. then and of yourself, you and I don't qualify to go boldly to the throne of grace. We're not our righteousness. That self-righteousness is what that would be. But, but this is, he said, yet like as thou one thing. He knew what, what this individual had issues with, obviously. He said, all that thou, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And then they went on and, and said, uh, Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful. He said, I hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of heaven. We can properly interpret it. Those that riches have them. Verse 25, for it is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now I didn't get into my message tonight, believe it or not. But this is the part of the Lord wanted me to say. That's why I'm reading this. They that heard it said, who then can be saved? And Jesus said this in verse 27. This applies to, to you tonight. The things which are impossible with men. It's a fact there are things that are impossible in this world. Yeah. There are things that are impossible with others. You're trusting them. There are things that are impossible even with faith in yourself. But Jesus said the things which are impossible with men, they're possible with God. We put our faith in God. We can turn God will turn impossibilities into possibilities. But this up here in verse 22, about inherent eternal life. Jesus said, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that you have, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. This guy was uh, following the letter of the law, or so he thought. Right? He's following the letter of the law. He believes, what did the Jews believe to begin with? Concerning salvation. That you obtain salvation by your good works. You obtain salvation by obeying and following the letter of the law. Jesus told him, he said, Yet like as I one thing, sell all that you have, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And then this last part is actually the most important. He said, Then come follow me. What Jesus is telling him is the plan that you have currently will never work. You want eternal life, and you think you obtain it by your own self effort. You think you obtain righteousness or your standing or salvation in and through how good you are and how good uh, you can do. It'll never work. It didn't matter how hard the guy tried, he would never obtain salvation because he had to come follow Jesus. Right? You say, well, this is, this is confusing. I believe the Holy Ghost and the Word will help you to understand it. Because many would say, well, i got to work hard. Yeah, the Bible says so. There's things I must do. Yeah, the easiest way to figure this out if you want to call it that yourself, is to wake up daily and renew your mind with the Word of God. God, the Holy Spirit through the Word of God will help you to see these things because this is actually something that, that will not uh, transpire overnight. It's not, not something you grasp overnight. And it's so camouflaged, so good. A lot of good things that everybody, even the church, is not a God thing. Just because it looks good, seemingly, is not necessarily God. There are things that you can do that others are doing. 
that may be God for them, and others may say it was good for you, but if God hadn't called you to it, it'd be disobedience. Right? What has God said? Now, now we've got to get further in this, but I don't have all night tonight. There are people here, I know by the Holy Ghost, that your answer is not to try harder. It's not. Your answer is to come to a place of surrender for whatever you've been dependent on. Realize, I cannot do it alone. I cannot change this. I cannot address this. It does, and again, it does not matter if you made decisions to put yourself in those situations. Just ask God to forgive you, and He will. Amen. He will. Understand, though, your basis for everything. Your righteousness is today, every day. And I'm letting you go. But we go boldly. When you give us the little teeny revelation of this, on your best days, you go boldly to God. But you realize even on your worst days, you need to go more boldly to God on those days than any other day. Because you need more Jesus than you ever had. Amen. But if you are a unknowingly, you could be unknowingly. But if you are a self-righteous person and, and you're always endeavoring to, you know, up one day and down the next, you're focused, you're looking in the wrong mirror. You're looking in that mirror in the bathroom. And you're looking at that person and you realize, and the devil is sliding in to help you. He'd be in the bathroom with you. Oh, you missed a hair. You missed it there. You're a failure here. Oh, you're not good at so-and-so. Oh, you can't do this. And you can't do that. You clean it up later and just spit the devil in the mirror. You liar. You're nothing but a liar. I'm going to God the Father not based on my goodness, my worthiness. You know, the church thinks they're being honorable. Oh, we're all sinners. None of us is worthy. That's a lie from hell. Amen. You're not worthy because of nothing you did. Yes, you are worthy. That's a lie. And the preacher ought to be beaten with stripes for telling people that. You are worthy. You're worthy based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are. Our faith, our, what is righteousness? It's our standing today as a Christian. I don't care the condition of your life. The only way it's going to change is when you get a revelation of your position in Christ Jesus. Amen? So get focused on God in Christ Jesus. Go boldly to Him wherever you're at. you got a right not because of you, but because of Him. Yes. Amen? Yes. My God, if you wait till you're good enough, it's not going to be till you get to heaven. Because you'll be stuck right where you're at. And I said when you get to heaven, but you can get to heaven and live a defeated life here, and it's not God's will. We're going over, not under. You're more than conquering for the Christ Jesus. Thank you for you. Father, we love you and thank you tonight. We thank you for this day. You many blessings.